thank you all for coming to our talk. It's really a pleasure um, to be sharing this work with you and to be here with so much of the team. I'm going to start by um, re reading our lab's territorial acknowledgement that we've written together. Carleton University and the Transgender Media Lab offices are located on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Nation. Members of our lab also live on many different territories across Turtle Island. Settler colonialism is a structure based on the forceful elimination of indigenous peoples. In the Canadian context, this has expressed itself in the form of cultural genocide and land theft. Universities have long contributed to colonial harms, including stealing indigenous lands and resources, treating colonized and enslaved people as things, pathologizing trans and two-spirit lives and bodies, and maintaining Western colonial and sexist concepts of gender and sexuality. Colonialist research has often denied indigenous peoples the right to make their own decisions. We strive to break this pattern. We aim to uphold the ways indigenous artists, communities, and nations continue to define themselves and their rights. Being on Anishinaabe Aki or Algonquin territory comes with responsibilities. Throughout our work, we strive to understand the obligations this creates for us here and now. We want to uplift indigenous led initiatives on unceded Algonquin territory. One example is the amazing Assembly of Seven Generations, an indigenous owned and youth led nonprofit focused on cultural support. You can check out their current initiatives and donate online. I really recommend checking them out. Chimigwech. I also want to make a statement about the strike that one of Carleton's unions is currently engaging in. None of the members of our lab are in this union, but we're very much in solidarity with them. UP 4600 represents contract instructors and teaching assistants at Carleton. They've been on strike since Monday, fighting for fair pay, protecting intellectual property, and better health benefits plans, retirement savings, and emergency funds. They do essential work at the university and their demands should be met immediately. So I'm glad we can spread the word to a wider audience about the shenanigans that Carleton University is up to and hopefully put more pressure on them to uh, do the right thing. All right, so what is the transgender media portal and why is it? So I like to start with this slide with four different movie posters. All of these movies um, include trans characters, sometimes as main characters and sometimes as um, important supporting characters. The first two films, uh, I ask people like, who has seen or heard of these films? Usually most people nod and say yes. You know, they if they haven't seen it, they've at least heard of it. But the second two films, when I ask who has seen or even heard of the films, it's a lot fewer. The numbers are a lot fewer. And the big difference between the two sets of films is the first two are created by all cisgender teams about trans people. And the second two are created by trans teams about trans people. And they have much lower budgets, much smaller marketing campaigns, smaller distribution campaigns. They're not available on Netflix. So um, sometimes people think like, oh, the problem is trans people just haven't had a chance to make movies. Like, you know, they need to have a chance to make movies. And it's true that more and more people should have a chance. But the problem is not that trans people have not made movies. They've actually made thousands of movies for many decades. The problem is it's hard to find these movies. And even if you know the name of it, it's hard to figure out like how you can see it or how you can program it at your school. So that's where the transgender media portal comes along. We have two main goals with the project. The first goal is to make trans-made films more available to educators, festival programmers, trans filmmakers, and trans organizers. The second goal is to enable new kinds of research questions about trans and two-spirit filmmaking in Canada and the United States. Questions like, what kinds of aesthetic and generic and narrative strategies have trans and two-spirit filmmakers used? How has trans-made cinema changed over time? Are there geographic trends in trans and two-spirit filmmaking? 
So you can go check out our website right now and it explains a lot about the project. It has a lot of important resources. But what I'm showing you here is a preview, a mock-up of the website we're currently in the midst of building. Uh, you're gonna hear more about it from some of our presenters, but I wanna point out a few key things. Um, so this hero image, we're, we take screenshots from uh, films made by BIPOC trans filmmakers. The one you see here is by uh, the great film Lingua Franca by Isabel Sandoval. Um, if you look at the different boxes, uh, this enables you to browse filmmakers and films. Uh, we wanna highlight multiply marginalized filmmakers. And we also wanted to make this really intuitive and easy to use for people who are used to like browsing on Netflix. I also want to show the support trans artist button at the top right. Uh, this is a way to for any user or browser to materially support trans filmmakers by donating money to their um, Patreon or to their GoFundMe. Um, also at the very bottom, you can see our um, very short version of the of the um, the territorial acknowledgement, and you'll hear more about that too. So if you actually do a search, you'll get a page something like this. Um, these orange and white buttons at the top will show you the different sorts of things that we're collecting information about. If you look at the side, you see all the different ways that you can filter it. And this is one of, I think, our key interventions to existing tools and lists is that we're really thinking a lot about how to make things really findable to people by the, the sorts of questions they might have or the interests they might have. And so you can see um, right now we're looking at media works and you can sort it by genre and keyword, um, different release years, durations, and I'm gonna go down. You can sort to find works made by people with different kinds of demographics. And, so, and several of our presenters are gonna talk more about that. Uh, you also can exclude content. It's kind of like a trigger warning at the very bottom if there's uh, types of material that you don't want to watch or that you uh, want to screen things and know that it doesn't have certain kinds of material. Um, this is a preview of what a filmmaker page will look like. Again, you'll hear a little bit more about it soon. And this is a preview of what a film page will look like. All right, I will turn it over to Evie, who is in person in the room. Hello. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Laura. Uh, hello, my name is Evie. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I'm a member of the Community Accountability Research and Data Wrangling team at the Transgender Media Lab. Uh, I'm a white settler, and I have light skin, I have short, dark hair, and I'm wearing a forest green uh, sweater with um, thin, uh, light, uh, thin blue stripes. Um, <clears throat> so I also live, I'm, even though I work uh, with the Transgender Media Lab, I live in Saskatchewan in Treaty 4, which is uh, the territories of the Anishinaabeg, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Neohawk, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So I joined the Transgender Media Lab in fall 2020, and during that year, we were preparing for a larger team. We went from a team of five to 12 people in 2021. And as we were preparing for this larger team, we began thinking about how we could create an environment in which we would all be inspired to work together to push back against the power structures of the lab. Next slide, please. So to do this, we had to face the limitations of the lab head on and acknowledge that the Transgender Media Lab is federally funded and operates within a colonial cis heteropatriarchal institution. And then we began to imagine what kind of community we wanted to work toward building and what tactics we could adopt to help create that, that community. Next slide. So Laura and I set out to answer the question, how can we run a lab that's fair, transparent, effective, fun, and in line with trans, anti-racist, anti-colonial, feminist, queer, and crip values? Next slide, please. Maya Livio and Lori Emerson are two feminist media scholars and two of the organizers of a symposium on what is a feminist lab. And they trace the lineage of labs back to the 16th century, arguing that the contemporary interdisciplinary lab is rooted in a colonial, racist, sexist, and ableist history. And that if we aren't actively working against it, these inherited power dynamics could inform how we structure our lab today and the type of knowledge that we produce in the lab. Through our research, we also found that Martina Angela Coretta of the Hydro Feminist Lab and Carolyn Faria 
of the Feminist Geography Collective advocate for slow scholarship and an ethics of care within an increasingly neoliberal academy. So for Coretta and Faria, this looks like collaborating with graduate and undergraduate students, engaging in slow transformative mentorship, challenging hierarchies, doing regular check-ins on everyday ups and downs, prioritizing shared responsibility and actively working against a culture that fosters competition. Next slide, please. One of our lab's biggest inspirations has been CLEAR, which is a feminist anti-colonial marine science lab at Memorial University. And in their words, rather than assuming we are value neutral or that the product of research is more important than the process, we work towards humility, accountability, collectivity, and good land relations in everything we do, from how we run a lab meeting to how we take out the trash. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Every three to four years, CLEAR lab members engage in a collaborative process to determine the lab's values, and CLEAR then develops ethical protocols and guidelines for how to ensure they are putting these values into practice, and they record these in the CLEAR lab book, which is a publicly available document. Next slide. So we were inspired by the CLEAR lab book, and we drafted the Transgender Media Lab Handbook, which describes how we work together. Next slide, please. Similar to CLEAR, we participated in a values-defining workshop and collectively chose our lab values, which are challenging hierarchies, radical honesty and listening, community-oriented and BIPOC trans-centered, and care ethics. Next slide. <clears throat> Identifying and articulating our values, however, is only part of the process. As CLEAR notes, there is too often a gap between what an organization or institution proclaims to value and its actions. So we have asked ourselves questions like, what does it look like to practice radical honesty and listening? What steps are needed to challenge hierarchies in the lab's day-to-day -day work? To help ensure that we are practicing our ethics, uh, similar to CLEAR, we develop guidelines and protocols as well. The TML currently has 26 protocols and one rule, all of which are recorded in our lab handbook. Next slide. Some of the concrete ways that we enact our values in the lab are, for example, our number one rule in the lab, which is the same as CLEAR's number one rule, is if you're sick, heartbroken, or exhausted, go home or log off. This job is not more important than your well-being. <clears throat> and people in the lab have expressed appreciation for this. So during our values-defining workshop, for example, many people told stories about how they feel that this actually, um, the lab actually does put people before work and how it truly feels like no one in the lab is disposable. Next slide, please. We've developed conflict resolution protocols, including how to call someone in rather than calling someone out, how to respond when you've been called in, and how to apologize. Next slide. We've also developed protocols for how to run a meeting. These include doing a check-in at the start of every meeting so lab members can share how they're doing. We rotate who leads meetings on a volunteer basis, which allows lab members to gain experience and skills with chairing meetings. And although there is a hierarchical structure to the lab, we engage in meaningful and sometimes very long discussions about almost every decision the team makes, and most project decisions are made by voting at team, at team meetings. Next slide. We also invest in skills building, so team members are provided with anti-oppression facilitation training, and we do this so that we can draw on the skills we've learned to help make space for everyone to contribute and be heard at meetings, and so that we can support uh, disagreement and generative conflict. We also participated in a workshop on conflict resolution where we practiced scenarios of conflict and how to resolve them by calling one another in. So we know that we can never entirely escape the power structures of the lab, and that we do sometimes make mistakes and that we are going to make mistakes. But these protocol, protocols help to align our behavior and the work that we're doing with our values and ultimately help us to build the type of community that we want to be part of, not in the future, but right now. Thanks. And I'll pass it over to Jada, who's online. Great, thank you so much, Evie. Uh, so my name is Jada Ganonday. I use she, they pronouns. Uh, I'm a descendant of stolen people on stolen land, currently residing on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory. And I'm wearing a red sweater and matching lipstick with uh, long black hair. And uh, I'm a lighter skinned black person. Next slide, please. Questions have been integral in developing our politics, aesthetics, and team. But we've also had to confront normative ideas around knowledge production. 
The ideology of whiteness centers this idea that white people in the global north have and are burdened with a kind of inherent knowledge which justifies domination. In our lab, we've been working to actively and consistently confront our positioning within these greater structures and make space to say that as researchers, we have a lot to learn. I took part in the website reviews and wrote policy with the Indigenous consultations, social media, image ethics, and BIPOC committees, and we were often left with more questions than answers. We had to face the idea that not knowing, putting answers aside while we develop relationships within our communities and produce more questions is okay. When we view colonization and racialization as processes, not events nor actions, we can understand our active roles in challenging them. The TML is confronting the ideology and aesthetics of whiteness as an ongoing process of recognition, challenging, reframing, and critique without a clear or single endpoint. Next slide, please. This approach contradicts many of the conventional values of academia. The urge to not just possess, not just produce, but to possess knowledge, to create an other with which we can contrast and constitute ourselves. We tend to rush through the development of knowledge in our fields to focus not on developing dynamic and complex relationships with the people we're researching. We externalize our tools and knowledge from the people we're studying, assuming that they are not the users and consumers of our research. The effective development of digital ethics with the use of anthropological methods involves radically flipping that lens and bringing the relationship between researchers and the people they study to the forefront. In this digital ethics work, I've tried to move away from the desire to produce a universal knowledge of the world based on the common sense of researchers in colonial institutions and to instead adapt some of the long-term relationship-based research strategies adopted by social scientists to guide the technological process. Next slide. One of the ways in which I and the TML team have adapted these methods is through our approach to identity data. Due to the affordances and limitations of the technology, we've moved to incorporate both closed and open identity terms into a survey, combining a limited list of gender and ethnicity terms with an open field in which filmmakers can enter any of their preferred terms. As a racialized person, I'm deeply aware of the discomfort that comes with filling out these kinds of surveys. The struggle to encapsulate the totality of my being into categories that were created to aid in my dehumanization. For this reason, we were guided by the BIPOC community relations policy, secondary research, and relationships with the community as we created and adapted the survey. Our central question in this process was how do we combat othering processes while we operate within othering structures with technology, with formats, and with expectations that come out of the capitalist colonial academic tradition? Next slide. One of the major changes we made throughout the process was allowing users to click any number of options and shifting our language away from what are you and toward how would you like to be found in the database? with a thorough awareness of the nuances of political, social, and artistic identity. This allowed us to both consciously recognize and outwardly state the purpose of this data, not to come to possess every aspect of the artist's being, but to create a space in which artists, sorry, in which searchable categories uh, could highlight the various identities of the artists. This also resulted in a shift in how we categorize Indigenous identity adopting both an Indigenous and a First Nations Inuit Métis option to avoid the racialization of indigeneity while recognizing colonization as an ongoing international process of land and identity dispossession. We aim to reflect how Indigenous peoples are identifying themselves and building solidarity. Next slide. We altered our survey again in the fall when we decided to change our ethnicity closed vocabulary term from a single Asian Pacific Islander term to multiple terms which represent the variety of identities across the region. This came up in my conversations with South, South Asian artists who spoke to their lack of representation even within BIPOC spaces and in my research on the Orientalist production of a monolithic East. Next slide. These thought processes came from positioning myself in community with racialized artists, from building relationships with community members and organizations with the intention of building a shared knowledge and point of analysis. This comes out of an intention of engaging with people rather than aiming to fully apprehend their existence as spectacles or as others. 
At the same time, this relationship is fundamentally dependent upon a thorough, consistent examination of the academic structures in which we operate. It depends on an awareness that we are trusted as producers of knowledge only because of an uneven distribution of institutional power, which we must challenge in our thought processes and engagements with technology at all points. Next slide. This is the basis of using social sciences to build ethics in the TML. Our development of ethical research tools depends on the gradual process of relationship building and responsibility to not only our team, but the people we are aiming to engage with and represent. To do so, our goals must shift from creating a project which is external to the interests of the represented people toward creating projects to be consumed, seen, and critiqued by the people who are being represented. And I'll pass it over to Kate. Um. Thanks so much, Jada. Um, my name is Kate Higginson. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm a white cis settler here on unceded Algonquin territory, colonially known as Ottawa. Um, I'm light skinned with long curly brown hair. I'm wearing a gray sweater in front of a bookcase with some plants that are trying to escape. Um, I'm the project manager for the TMP and I'm really happy to be here today to talk a bit about one of the smaller working groups uh, within the lab flowing from the values of the lab, which Evie spoke about, including being anti-racist and anti-colonial, and in step with the work that Jada described on digital ethics. Last year, Evie, Jada, Laura, and I formed an Indigenous Initiatives Working Group. And since the fall, we've been in conversation with a number of super helpful colleagues uh, and two spirit scholars in the School of Indigenous Studies and the Indigenous Community Engagement Office here at Carleton, uh, as well as with some really fantastic arts administrators at Indigenous art and film organizations. With their guidance, we, as a lab that's made up mostly of non-Indigenous people, have been working through issues including Indigenous genders and identity data, how the lab can be in better relationship with the Anishinaabe Aki territory close to Carleton, and how we might best support two-spirit Indigenous trans and gender non-conforming artists and visitors to our database. Next slide. Jada has touched on some of the pitfalls of collecting identity data and how we have revised our terminology around global indigeneity. We've also been thinking through how to include Indigenous people in our database while recognizing that trans as a label might not always be the best one or the most relevant concept in some cases. Transgender and non-binary are concepts from Western colonial cultures and carry assumptions that don't always align well with Indigenous conceptions of gender. As we saw like so powerfully in the really wonderful um, Two-Spirit panel this morning, Two-Spirit has proven to be a really useful Indigenous umbrella term in many contexts, but it also has certain complexities and is specific to North America. Our conversations this year have also suggested the usefulness of other broad terms like indigenous queer, indigenous trans or gender non-conforming, and traditional genders. Specific traditional concepts of sex and gender rooted within indigenous languages and nations carry rich meanings, which many people are working now to recover and reclaim. And we really wanna honor and make space for these traditional and culturally specific genders to make sure that the database and our artist surveys provide the flexibility to include these specific genders along with whichever other identity terms the artist wants to select and include in their bio. We've also been working on how to account within the database for gender fluidity and how identity changes over time as well as gathering recommendations for how to approach cases where we're not sure about someone's Indigenous identity. So options on the table there include adding a field to our survey to allow each artist to tell their own story and affiliations that's not constrained uh, by checkboxes and forming an Indigenous advisory board uh, to guide us on this. Next slide. So we have a lot more to do, but it's felt really good to be taking some of these beginning steps uh, to be in better relation with the local Algonquin communities of Pigwak Nagan First Nation and Kitagansi Bionishnabeg and their unceded territories. Uh, Evie and Laura and I were able to take Carlton's new Kinemogawan Indigenous Learning uh, mini course last year, which was great. We've worked together to create a territory acknowledgement tailored to our location and project that talks about um, obligations in ways that we hope will spark action and kind of move beyond being like an empty performance. 
Each page on our new website, which we're super excited to be launching soon, will include a like short territory acknowledgement in the footer that links to a much more in-depth page for Indigenous initiatives that includes information on local Algonquin communities and organizations, um, land back and missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls two-spirit actions to support, a showcase of two-spirit and Indigenous trans art and film projects. We've started talking with Carlton's Algonquin Liaison Officer about translating our land acknowledgement into Algonquin and working together with language carriers um, on traditional Algonquin genders. Next slide. It's also been heartening to think through some of the ways that we can promote the work of Indigenous filmmakers. So on our current website, we have a BIPOC trans filmmakers listing that's been really useful for festival programmers and teachers who are looking for specific films. We also plan to expand our representation of Indigenous and culturally specific identities with a page that's dedicated to Two-Spirit and Indigenous trans and gender diverse filmmakers. We really want to represent the diversity of Two-Spirit identities in art without erasing their specificity and the significance of the many different identities that are housed under that big uh, two-spirit umbrella term. We wanna offer a place for two people, two-spirit people to easily find the films that may speak to their own experiences. Next slide. Our new uh, website design also features a homepage that has this large hero header at the top, as Laura mentioned, like a rotating uh, slider of images that will showcase films um, made by Two-Spirit and Indigenous trans artists, as long as, along with other BIPOC trans artists. Um, we're also collecting more specific uh, Two-Spirit resources to add to our find support list for filmmakers. And we've been having a lot of fun talking with Indigenous film festivals and organizations like the Asanabka Indigenous Film Festival here in Ottawa, Kin Theory Indigenous Media Creatives Network, uh, the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival, and Wapakoni Mobile about how to co-present uh, Two-Spirit and Indigenous trans and gender non-conforming film screenings and events uh, coming up this summer and next year. So overall, I would say it's been like really wonderful to begin these relationships with these inspiring organizations this year. And we're looking forward uh, to seeing how they can grow in the months ahead. Um, and to everyone in the room, um, we'd really welcome any feedback and suggestions on any of this. So uh, miigwetch and thank you. I'll pass it to Kit. Sorry. There we go. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. My Wi-Fi dropped, um, so hopefully that will not happen again. Uh, can everyone see me okay? Great. Okay, cool. So, hi. Uh, my name is Kit. Uh, pronouns are uh, he and they, and I am located in Tijoke, which is colonially known as Montreal, uh, which is part of the Gagne uh territory. And I'm a light-skinned white person uh, with bleach blonde curtain hair, uh, wearing a black zip-up hoodie, and I'm surrounded by uh, my books here in my living room. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about the process of interfacing identity on the portal. Next slide, please. So I want to start us off with a quote from the excellent anthology on trans visibility called uh, Trapdoor. And it reads, immense transformational and liberatory possibilities arise from what are otherwise sites of oppression or violent extraction, whether the body, labor, land, or spirituality, when individuals have agency over their representation. So that's uh, from Tourmaline, Eric A. Stanley, and Joanna Burton in 2017. And a desire for this transformation and the liberatory uh, possibilities of self-representation underlies everything that we do here on the project, from our lab values, to our community consultations, to our data collection and processing. And this includes the space that I'm addressing here, which is the design of the portal's user interface. So I'm uh, listed as the TMP's user interface and experience designer, and that means that my role is to, is to develop the graphical representations of the films and individuals listed in our database, uh, including all the, the identity data, which we've carefully collected. And while I might be the person who's kind of clicking the mouse here, uh, it's really important for me to underline that this is a really collaborative role. Um, it involves consultations with members from numerous communities, uh, iterative user testing, and of course, lots of discussions uh, between team members, sometimes happening for weeks at a time. Um, so it's a long and always ongoing uh, process involving many, many people. Uh, slide, please. So 
what does it mean to design an interface? And what even is an interface? Um, Florian Kramer and Matthew Fuller define the interface as the point of juncture between different bodies, hardware, software, users, and what they connect to or are part of. So interfaces describe, they hide, and condition the asymmetry between the elements conjoined. The asymmetry of the powers of these bodies is what draws the elements together. So interfaces structure representation by connecting two entities, and they always involve asymmetrical power relations. And next slide. And this brings us to some questions. So how do we ensure that the portal's interface is useful for filmmakers, audiences, and researchers while still retaining as much agency as possible in its subject's self-representations? Or in other words, how do we navigate the inherent power asymmetry of the portal's interface? Slide, please. So one answer to this question involves how we collect the data on people in our database and why. Um, so first, uh, as a dis disclaimer, uh, all the images that we're sharing here today about the portal, they're uh, mock-ups, it's all test data. So none of this data is accurate. Um, so if you're looking for Tessie McTesterson's latest feature film, you're gonna have some trouble finding it. Um, so as Jada demonstrated in her presentation earlier, uh, people are organized in the portal uh, by open and closed identity data. And some of these closed vocabularies are mandatory. Uh, and these are the ternary uh, categories, which means that they have three possible options, zero, one, or left blank. And we use these ternary uh, data categories to divide people in the portal into these major overlapping groups as trans plus, BIPOC, and or disabled. And these categories are problematically normalizing in many ways, uh, which is why we try to describe these categories according to their purpose rather than their subjective meaning. So for example, the trans plus category description reads, should the person show up when a user searches for trans artists? We also opted to make these categories ternary rather than binary in order to leave room for uncertainty and non-knowledge. So we strive to ensure that these data follow the individual's own identity as they understand it in the moment of uh, data collection, recognizing that there's always gonna be tension between how they represent themselves and how we come to represent them on the portal. Slide please. So. What does this look like for users? Well, the primary advantage of these ternary categories is that they allow us to have these toggles listed at the top of the search result filters so that you can toggle between showing only trans people, uh, showing only BIPOC, and showing only disabled people. And these can be turned on in combination with each other. And we've also designed the show only trans plus toggle to be on by default when searching um, for people within the database, which is a feature that our preliminary user testing uh, really loved. So black feminist technology scholars like uh, Sophia Noble remind us that the algorithms which order search results are never neutral. They actually tend to actively reinforce social categories of oppression. And we strive to counter this rule by not only offering identity-based search filters, but also by prioritizing BIPOC and disabled trans artists in our search uh, results, um, which is determined by these ternary ca categories. And we've also included a link right above these toggles, which invites users to learn more about these filters. And so that will take them to our help and FAQ page, where we describe how the data are collected, categorized, and used in the, in the portal. Uh, next slide, please. So when a user navigates to an individual page within the portal, the first thing they see is the person's name and their pronouns. Um, there's, then there's an identity sidebar, which includes an image if we have one, and their biographical data. Again, these are all uh, made up data here that I'm showing you. But all these data come from either the filmmaker themselves or from publicly available sources. Um, and in, in an effort to return some agency to the individual's self-representation once in the portal, we also include a link at the top of every record inviting people to email us to revise their entry or to request it be deleted. This does lead to some other problems like verification. How do we know if we're actually being emailed by the person in question? Um, but we've decided that it's best to keep these questions in mind and address them if and when they become an issue, um, because each case is likely going to be diff different. So in addition to the person's job titles, the identity sidebar also includes these orange bubbles. And these are all the open vocabulary terms that the subject uh, has used to describe their identity. And this can include anything from their gender identity to their star sign. And you might also notice that the closed ternary categories of trans plus, BIPOC, and disabled are missing from these bubbles. And that's because these terms, while really useful for sorting profiles within the portal, are ultimately overgeneralizing, and they tend to misrepresent many, if not most, of the people listed in our database. Uh, of course, if they do use these terms to describe themselves, they'll be listed in the open vocabularies, and they'll show up in the bubbles. Next slide, please. So challenging the problematic opacity of search uh, algorithms also means that we've decided it's important to make the data which inform the search ordering transparent. 
So this led us to develop the metadata section on each person's page. And this box is closed by default. So these terms are not as easily visible as the rest of the person's page. When they're opened, users are shown a blurb at the top, which describes how these categories are used for search and that they're not necessarily the words that the individual um, uses for themselves. And again, another link to our help page and FAQ. So we then list the ternary vocabulary terms which shape how this user is sorted within the portal. And we actively choose to use language here, which doesn't imply that these terms define the individual's identity. Instead, we focus again on how these terms are used within the portal itself. Next slide, please. So I wanna end my contribution here today with a short quote uh, from Sasha uh, costanza Shock, whose book Design, uh, Design Justice really inspires me. And they say that design justice rethinks design processes, centers people who are normally marginalized by design and uses collaborative creative processes to address the deepest challenges our communities face. So while interfaces involve power asymmetries by definition, we strive to embody the principles of design justice by being intentional with the data that we collect and designing features which can help support rather than further marginalize the people listed in the portal and its wide variety of users. And as Costanza Chalk uh, explains, this process is always ongoing and collaborative. There's no easy answers here, uh, but it's absolutely necessary in our hope to open up the transformational and liberatory possibilities of trans self-representation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kit. Uh, I'm Constance Crompton. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, I'm a white cisgendered woman uh, with uh, pale skin, and uh, I'm uh, wearing a black t-shirt and a gray blazer. Um, so I'm, I'm here to, to launch the section on our technical approaches. Uh, you'll hear quite a bit about the architecture um, under the hood of the new site. The original prototype of the site was built in Drupal. Um, this was before I uh, joined the team, um, but was a, uh, um, and was for the um, early team members, a, a fruitful way to explore what kind of functionality um, the, the site could have. It did, however, eventually pose um, a bit of a challenge. It was quite difficult to get uh, data out and Maddie Murakami, who's here um, in the call too, might be speaking to that a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, and uh, it it also um, posed uh, problems for forward migration for folks who've worked with Drupal before. You know, it's um, uh, it's quite a large and, and uh, for inputting data, often easy to use package. Uh, you know, very sort of configurable, um, but does require uh, forward uh, regular forward uh, migration and uh, maintenance. Uh, so as a team, uh, we considered a lot of different options for the architecture of the second version of the site, um, looking at some um, high powered archival grade repository based systems with front ends for surf surfacing things um, all the way down to um, more sort of low tech options. And we've ended up um, adopting, next slide please, the um, uh, endings project uh, principles. Uh, the endings project uh, is uh, run out of uh, uh, the University of Victoria, where I know most uh, folks in the audience uh, are today. The PI is Claire Carlin, um, but it uh, it has contributions from uh, collaborators uh, in the library, in um, the humanities, um, as well as from different universities across Canada. And uh, the endings project really started with the uh, the idea of being able to come up with uh, methods for starting a project that could uh, that folks could step away from at any time. Uh, this is really aimed at work in the academic context where people are on grant cycles and sort of sh short funding cycles where people have you know, three years or five years of funding um, for a project, but who may have to step back from it at any time. That said, it does have broad apl applicability. There are folks working in the arts or in community groups who are often in, uh, and non-commercial spaces who are often in um, similar, um, similar positions. Uh, and uh, there are a few, there are you know, several sort of principles that underpin a project endings project, um, but they're all aimed at, at uh, the developing the longevity um, of the project. The one that is particularly uh, key here is this one at the bottom, that there are no um, external dependencies, or if they are, the, uh, the site can continue on um, even if those sort of parts break. And of course, we've all used websites that are like clearly broken. Uh, you know, sometimes if it's, it's just images that are missing and like that's kind of okay to use, but um, sometimes there's like large chunks or, or sort of things breaking down. 
Uh, and the idea is that you know, by adopting the project endings principles, you can end up with a website that can live on the web without a huge amount of um, maintenance forward uh, and forward migration. Next slide, please. Uh, the key uh, uh, technologically uh, to some of that um, uh, designing for longevity is not being database backed as databases often uh, require um, uh, lots of forward migration uh, in order to uh, keep up to date, to be patched, uh, to like not sort of be um, uh, hackable, um, as well as uh, um, uh, using uh, um, design principles uh, that, uh, that work well with uh, low bandwidth, um, and uh, that are easy to archive for posterity. Uh, the so project endings uh, based websites are often uh, HTML only, and this is going to be the case for us as well with uh, what looks like database like search functionality, but a search that is actually running on um, uh, a JSON index of all of the HTML pages. So it's all flat HTML pages. This is useful. It makes them very easy to load, makes them very easy to archive. They are text, text, text. Um, they don't require any sort of drilling down into a database in order to surface the material for the user. This is great for longevity. Um, it also means that this material is easily indexed by search engines, and that cuts both ways, as we'll be discussing a little bit later um, uh, today, because, of course, uh, things that are easily indexed means that we can find these films, that they can be programmed to that initial vision that we uh, led the presentation with. Um, but it also means that it makes the site easy to find, and uh, sometimes there are very good reasons to um, uh, to not want to be found um, on the web. So we'll be talking a little bit um, about how we're sort of handling um, those tensions. Uh, this is just a quick overview of... Um, of what our workflow looks like. We've got archival and web research, uh, teams of researchers going through old festival programs and um, uh, populating the spreadsheets that we've looked at uh, so far. Um, and then uh, we have scripts that convert the spreadsheet content into XML um, and then from there into um, HTML with some CSS. And then it is only HTML and CSS and JSON um, that uh, that end up on the web, which uh, those are like sustainable formats that like, if any of those three stop working, it's because there's a global disaster of some sort on the web that it would be sort of outside of the scope um, of our project. I'm gonna turn it over uh, there to Mel Retro. Uh, hello, my name is Mel Racho, and uh, my pronouns are he, him. I am queer, trans, and Fili I'm a queer, trans, Filipinx settler. I am brown-skinned with longish black and gray hair. I've been on T for 12 years, and I've been trying and failing to grow a mustache for that long. My research interests include how to define and disassemble data colonialism and the systems and infrastructures that uphold its ex extractive practices. Prior to shifting into academia, I, wa I worked as a senior full stack web engineer for uh, 15 years. I'm completely self taught, and I adhere to a liberatory arts activist approach in building web applications. Next slide. So I'll be guiding you through our tech process. Um, and as Connie elaborated upon, the minimal computing approach allows us to work iteratively. And um, it uh, is relatively lightweight. Um, without a database, we are able to be self-contained. All of our files are relative to one another. And what I mean by that is that uh, all of our files can be served or displayed from a single source, and we have full agency over that source. So to do that, we've split the work across a few different code uh, repositories, each with discrete tasks. Um, so using the endings project static search model to build the search mechanism itself. Uh, another uh, repository handles the actual generation of the archived pages. And lastly, a repository that holds the website files. Next slide, please. Okay, so for me, um, in this project and in my own work, I think a lot about data persistence in a changing and uh, horrifyingly oppressive world. Um, so there's a technical definition up there, but I wanted to take a moment and note that for this project, there's the research and then there's the technical approach. 
in other projects, that approach is often divorced from research and the tech stack is often obfuscated um, from the research questions. That's not the case with this project. Uh, so that said, I'm going to run through um, the next couple of slides kind of quickly to outline how we're getting this done. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so here's an abstracted view of our workflow, um, which as, at, at its core is uh, conver uh, the conversion of the research. So the, i.e. the spreadsheets, i.e. the CSVs. What happens is that the CSVs are exported and converted into XML documents. We apply extensible style sheet language translations, um, which then generate the HTML files, and then those files are document, uh, displayed online. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another uh, process slide. Uh, basically, code goes from one thing to the next thing, and it's, it's all very boring looking, but it is eventually very exciting. Um, so next slide, please. And so here, using the Endix project static search build, we start to see the shape of our collection um, of the generated HTML documents into something searchable and able to persist online. Uh, and the next slide, please. So that's the, this is our intended output, uh, what it will look like eventually. Next slide, please. Uh, so all of this to say that the um, whole approach is uh, the research or the coding in both the research uh, base way of understanding coding and the program programmatic way of understanding code, um, we try to, which we try to capture in our records. Uh, Next slide, please. So ultimately, what we are going to have is um, what the tool will build is a generated set of HTML reliant only on CSS and JavaScript, the foundational blo uh, blocks of the World Wide Web. At this stage, which is moving out of proof of concept to the actual build, we've uncovered some advantages as well as cha uh, challenges in the process. The advantages include Producing documents that are pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript means that they're easily archivable by projects like the Internet Archive, um, and that these documents that comprise the website are easy to deploy from anywhere. And lastly, it's a low bandwidth site. Uh, so it's fast, there's no database queries, so no backend. The backend is the research. Um, in terms of challenges, we're seeing that the learning curve to get uh, these build processes running are quite high. Uh, not having any external frameworks uh, like Bootstrap means no shortcuts. And lastly, uh, navigating visual expectations versus reality is important when you're coding like it's 1999. We, uh, we've had to accept and roll out a phased approach to this tool. So that's, that's pretty much where we're at. Uh, next slide, please. And very exciting, uh, there's the, there we're, we're, we're hosting a call for applications for a CSS person that will work uh, with us. Um, if you'd like to know more about the position, feel free to approach me or uh, check out, uh, check out the, the link down there, which is carlton.ca slash transmedia lab for more info. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll pass it on to Orvis. Thank you. I'm Orvis Starkweather, and I use they, them pronouns. I'm a white person with settler responsibilities. I'm based here on the Kwangan territories of the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Wasanich nations. I wear glasses, I have light skin, I've got an undercut, and I'm wearing a sweater and tie combination. Slide, please. I joined the project last, uh, this year to help with data analytics. And when I joined, the team already had a huge wish list of questions, like Laura mentioned. Questions like, what kind of aesthetic strategies have trans filmmakers used? What kinds of arts infrastructures support trans filmmaking? And how have trans made films and film festivals shaped our communities? But what quickly became clear is that we actually needed to start by turning the gaze on ourselves. Slide, please. So we started with, 
how many records are we creating each month? And do we have enough data that the tool will work? Um, we made this analysis a priority because of our commitment to living our values. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, this is about our team's capacity. When I started university, I was promised accommodations for my learning disabilities. And my needs were met maybe about 30% of the time. And for years, I struggled to pass my courses. Eventually, I learned that I could keep up with everyone by just doubling down on the amount of work that I was doing. By the time I reached grad school, I was absolutely burnt out. By the t um, at, since then, my commitment is to come up with realistic workloads. This goes back to the lab's number one, or the lab's one rule of logging off when you're exhausted. If a goal is unattainable, we need to change our processes rather than burn out the team. Slide, please. We're working this balancing act into our research processes. Sometimes, though not always, following the most ethical protocol is time consuming. How many articles do you need to read before you can accurately describe someone's identity? But if we spend too long researching each person, we end up with less content. If there are only a handful of records, then the portal is much less relevant to our, and useful to our communities. These analytics are helping us find the sweet spot where we get the best of both worlds. We're currently at the halfway point in our five-year grant, so now's the time for us to really hone our methods. Slide, please. So now comes the exciting part, where we get to peek at the data. So this graph is demonstrating the first 500 people records. It's a bar chart that illustrates which fields are heavily used and which are almost empty. And you're not going to be able to see it on the small screen, but I'll give you the high level key findings, which are we have minimal data about the disability status of craters, and we don't actually have that many dates in our data. Slide, please. Record gaps are a great way to spotlight where we need to adapt. For example, let's look at the disability status drop down menu. Our team only identified 1.2% of filmmakers as disabled. We're reflecting on how we can address this gap. Some ideas include, we could conduct targeted research into disabled trans creators, or we could take a hard look at our research processes. It's possible our team is missing coded disability keywords or it could be that there's a flaw with how we're, prioriti how we're prioritizing which filmmakers to research. Slide seven, please. Finally, let's talk about filmmaker dates. We know that our users are expecting to be able to search by content creators' life dates. If we only have a handful of records with date information, the, uh, the search results might be small or even zero. This gives a false impression that there are fewer trans people making films, which is one of the key issues that we're trying to solve. <laughs> um, so I hope this uh, 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 couple examples around analysis into data gaps and the pace of record creation are a taste of how we're living our values. We want the transgender media portal to serve the needs of our communities. Thanks for joining our, uh, us on this tour of how we're embedding ethics into our processes and products. And we can't wait to answer your questions.